Welcome to Mile Ground Motors, where we specialize in used four-wheel drive pickups and SUVs. All vehicles are clearly marked and come with a free Carfax report. Remember last winter? This year's going to be worse. Don't get stuck along the road. Fair, good, or excellent credit, we have the financing option for you. Mile Ground Motors, located on the Mile Ground in Morgantown. Always open at mileground.com. At the Landing Dental Spa, our goal is to provide quality dental care in a relaxed spa-like atmosphere. Dental chairs with heat and massage, warm neck wraps, and personal TVs make your appointment as stress-free as possible. Located off the Pierpont exit, now accepting new patients of any age. Call 304-594-2200 today and visit our website at www.com thelandingdentalspa.com to schedule an appointment. The Landing Dental Spa, a healthy smile with peace of mind. Welcome to Mile Ground Motors, where we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. Not for one week or one month, but four whole months. Every Saturday starting January 10th, we will be giving away a 32-inch flat screen TV to one of our lucky customers. The weekly drawing happens every Saturday till the end of April. No monkeying around, just great deals at Mile Ground Motors on the Mile Ground in Morgantown. Always open at mileground.com. So you thought the days of the corner drugstore were gone. Well, you'll want to try the Pierpont Landing Pharmacy. Pierpont Landing Pharmacy is locally owned and operated and specializes in patient counseling and prescription compounding. Pierpont Landing can even handle veterinary products, just like the old corner drugstore used to, plus a variety of over-the-counter products like greeting cards, Saris candies, and more. There's even a drive through window for your convenience. Pierpont Landing Pharmacy. The corner drugstore is back and better than ever. Whether you're mud bogging, work in the fields, or just cruising, the Tire Lady has just the right tire for you. And if you want your ride to really stand out, ask about tire and wheel combinations. Get the most out of your vehicle with the perfect set of shoes from the Tire Lady at Rainbow Tire in Masontown. The Tire Lady will take care of you. Rainbow Tire, the Tire Lady takes care of me. President, uh, board members, we have phase two done with PSG concerning our lighting project and uh, more efficiency in relationship with our school and utilities. And Audra is here, and Audra is certainly a friend of the Montana Board of Ed, and she will give you a report on how we've done in relationship to our project over the next the last couple of years. And then we need to also talk, maybe not necessarily tonight, but in a future meeting about phase three, which would at least uh, finish up the lighting project that we have for Mon County. So with that, Audra, please welcome. It's nice having you. And I'm sure you're going to let the board know how much money they've saved so far. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. so I just want to thank you all for your time this evening and uh, thank you all for being great partners to work with on a very successful guaranteed energy savings project. Um, just to get everybody on the same page, Phase one, these are some of the improvements that were completed in Montegay County Schools. We did improvements to eight facilities here in the county. We did $2.3 million worth of improvements and the guaranteed energy savings paid for the project and the, and the uh, savings are guaranteed. So I'm gonna go over the guarantee versus the actual savings. 
Um, you can see that during construction, we were able to save 98,000, over $98,000. And uh, year one, which ran from 2000, November 2012 to October 2013, I reported that annual report last year. And um, you can see we guaranteed $88,000. $39 and we were able to save $131,122 and uh, this year's report ran from November 2013 to October 2014 and we guaranteed $88,000 and we saved $123,671 so um, overall we have exceeded the savings guarantee by $177,392 This is the chart that shows the data from the period that I just talked about, which is November 2013 to October 2014. I know it's probably an eye chart for you all, but, um, and for me too, but there's option A, option C, and agreed upon savings. And uh, you can see in every category, even though we're not held to a category, uh, we have exceeded or met the savings. So in option C, we were able to uh, save $89,346. In option A, we were able to save $22,189. And we met the savings on the agreed upon savings. So uh, this year we've exceeded our guarantee by $35,632. This is just a uh, chart to demonstrate um, your savings. The top line is the baseline, the bottom line is your current energy spend, and the yellow in between is the savings. So that's just another way of demonstrating it. And I just want to uh, thank Michael O'Brien for helping us get this utility information together. He's really good about seeing, sending the information to our M&V department, and uh, we really appreciate that. He's been a, a really good person to work with. And we, we really appreciate an engaged customer. So basically, that's it for the report. And I just want to thank you again. I also want to talk a little bit about the Phase 2 project that um, is complete now. So we have um, completed the upgrades in seven schools, including MTech. And um, it seems like everybody's pleased with that project. And um, we have, uh, I believe you all have signed your final acceptance today, so that was done in a short period of time. So um, I think there's three schools left for the lighting, but there may be some other HVAC or mechanical work that the county needs done. So do you guys have any questions? The concentration of this past phase two is all about lighting. We didn't delve, we didn't delve into any of those savings with some of the other things that ESG recommended. And I think that was about 1.1, is that right, that we put out? and we're able to kind of save that money. So phase three, we want to look at those three schools, which is primarily lighting, and then we want to see if there's anything else that we want to do. And we want to stay, once again, around five hundred dollars to $750,000, which is the commitment the board has made so we don't have to finance, borrow, or do anything. That's money we'll just try to allocate in the budget to be able to accommodate that. So the primary of the savings the last year has been with lighting. So. Right, and um, you're, after the final acceptance has been signed, which it has, I'm going to go through these reports. Um, your savings guarantee on phase two starts April the 1st. So um, we have a year and 90 days for uh, ESG to provide you an annual report on that project. So I'll be able to make another report next year. That's all I have. And just so everybody knows, it's guaranteed. So if we drop below that guarantee, you still provide the guarantee. That's correct. Thank you very much. Really Thank enjoy you. working with Monica at High Schools. I hope you had to come up here for someone else today, too, right? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Just a short little presentation. <laughs> well, thank you. We do appreciate it. Thank you. It's been great. Well, we went to Charleston to visit her. Well, we did. We've been down to visit Audra a few times, so. That's yes. right. While we were there, we went ahead and did a school board association. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. But we came just for him. Well, that's a short trip. We're, we're all used to being on I-10. I know. Okay, good. All right. Uh, Madam President and Board Members, uh, we have before us the proposal of our living rates for this coming school year. As you remember, we were at 75% last year. Uh, the Board looked at the rate and, and reduced it by 1%.
So the levy rate assessment this past year was for 74%. I've asked Mr. Hawkins to go ahead and present to the board uh, the 74% uh, that we have in front of us and then give you a differentiation if the board wanted to go back up to 75%, which is what we're legally able to do. So um, with that, Mr. Hawkins has his pie charts and graphs and he'll be able to put before you and kind of go over the levy rates for you. Ready? Yes, sir. Okay, okay uh, between March 20, uh, March 7 and March 28, the board has to adopt their proposed levy rates, and that's what we're here for this evening. And uh, once you approve it, it's submitted uh, to the state auditor for their approval. The that comes back, it's submitted to uh, copy to the uh, Department of Ed, and uh, then you reconvene on uh, Tuesday. Third Tuesday in April, that uh, actually laid the letter. And this is the calendar showing our schedule. March 24th tonight, we're going to approve the schedule of post levy rates, re recess this meeting until April the 21st, which is the third Tuesday. We'll forward copies to the state auditor and Department of Ed. We'll also publish it in the newspaper twice. Then on the third Tuesday in April, we'll reconvene and the board will officially enter the levies if there's no objection or no, if the state auditor finds any, doesn't find any problem with it. <coughs> and after that, we'll have our proposed budget on May the 12th. And the board will approve that. It'll be published. We'll hold a public hearing uh, on May the 26th, and then we'll submit our budget on May the 27th. And then you can see the uh, Last possible days I included on there to do those, that everything falls within that guide, those guidelines. This is our certificate of values that the assessor provides us for tax purposes. As you can see, class two property uh, total is two billion two hundred and eighty million. <coughs> class three is two billion two hundred and thirty-seven million. Class four is one billion twenty-six million for total assessed values tax purposes of five billion five hundred forty three million seven hundred ten thousand. Class one is our base rate. We no longer use that, but that's uh, the base rate. Class two is all property owned, used and occupied by the owner exclusively for residential purposes. Farms, land used for horticulture and grazing that are occupied and cultivated by the owner and bona fide tenants. Class three is all real and personal property outside municipalities other than class one and two uh, and class four is all real and personal property inside municipalities except for class one and class two properties the statewide regular levy rate is set by the legislature the base rate uh, didn't get the date change for 2016 is still 19.40 they didn't change the rate uh, for class one 38.8 for class two and 77.60 for class three and four. Our excess levy rates are established by the levy call at 75% of the maximum, the maximum being 22.95, so 75% would be 17.21. On class one, class two would be 34.42, class three and four, 68.84. The board determined to hold it at 104% last year. To calculate that, there's uh, the instructions on how to calculate that. We take the assessed values from the rollback form, uh, subtract new property, subtract TIF value, and you get assessed values excluding new property and TIF value. And then we use last year's total uh, gross tax collections and we put it in this form we weight each class by one two three by one two and four off of the rollback form get a total assessed value weighted assessed value then you take last year's projected gross tax collections times 104 percent which gives you the amount that you would collect if you had 104 percent you divide that by the weighted assessed value and the rate you would need to cap it at 104% would be 18.09. Our rate is below that, so we're way below 104%. The bond rate is calculated by uh, 
bond commission will tell us how much our bonds are due, how much interest is due, and uh, an allowance for delinquent and exonerations, and tell us the amount to be raised. <coughs> Those again are put into a formula, weighting them, one, two, and four. You get a weighted value, you, you take the amount that uh, to be raised, divided by the set weighted assessed value, and you get the base rate of 1.91 cents for $100 of assessed value. Two times that for class two, four times that for class three and four. Putting those figures into our schedule <coughs> proposed levy rates, you can see the assessed value off the certificate values, $5,543,000. Applying the rates for the regular levy, class two property will generate 8.8 million, class three, 17.35 million, and class four, 7.9 million for a total uh, gross collections of 34,168,000. We allow 5% for uncollectibles, exonerations, delinquencies, that's 1,700,000. 8,000, 2% for discounts, 649,000. The tax increment financing amount is subtracted from that, 1,164,000, which leaves the net projected tax collections at 30,646,000. The assessor then gets 2% of that, 612,000 for the assessor's fund. And our projected net tax collections for the regular levy is 30 million, $33,602. Remember, the regular levy is part of the state aid formula. That's our local share. So 90% goes to local share. The excess levy applying last year's rates, which the board kept at 16.99, which was 74%, will generate uh, the class two 7.7 .7 million class three, 15.2 million, class four, 6.9 million, or 29 million gross tax collections, allowing the 5% and 2%. Uh, the net projected tax collection will be 27,859,000. The total of those two will be 57,892,000. Uh, bond, applying the bond rates, will generate class two, 870,000, class three, 1.7 million, class four, 780,000. Total of 3.3 million less, it comes out to 4.83% for uh, uncollectibles. And that will bring in the 3,201,525, which is necessary to pay the bonds and the This shows the TIF calculation. Uh, class 2 TIF is uh, 23,649,000. Class 3, 31 million. And Class 4, 117.7 million. Total TIF value is 172,995,000. Applying the le regular levy rates, that would generate 1.25 million in uh, gross collections, subtracting the 7%, the 5 for uncollectibles, 2 for uh, discounts, and you get the net allowance for attaching the financing of 1164000 which was subtracted from the regular levy uh, previously. And you can see our property taxes uh, distribution for taxes collected by the school board, 46% uh, for the excess levy, 49% for the regular, and 5% of what the board collects goes to the bond fund. Go back one more time, please. That it used to be that we talked about our excess levy being about 25, 26%. Mm -hmm. Please note that's almost 50%. It's about 25% of our total budget, but it's 46% of our tax collections. Mm -hmm. And this is just a chart showing you can see the blue is the excess levy uh, by class of property. The Burgundy is a regular levy. Can't hardly see the bond, but it's a little bit of yellow on top. Uh, comparing our tax rates to the current year, so it's projected for next year, you can see that uh, there'll be a slight decrease again in 
the tax rate when you combine all three of them or because our bond rate went down. So it's 0.16, uh, which is a 0.42% decrease across the board. Now our Grove County facilities, we've been able to utilize that ever since we uh, started doing that about five or six years ago. And I won't read that this is the code on the Grove Facilities Act. And to calculate that amount, we take the set values less the rollback form, less the TIF value, which gives us the value of the new properties that are on the books. Applying the regular levy rates to those, our growth uh, on new property will be 671000 which is down considerably from last year one point three. So that, that will be subtracted from local share, so it doesn't go to, into the formula. That actually stays in the county, and we'll have to use that for facilities, I think. That's it. One thing I will point out, I didn't put the other chart that I usually do on there because it got so big it wouldn't fit. <coughs> but since 93-94, our tax rate has went down every year, slightly, uh, primarily due to the bond rate going down and due to the excess levy rate being reduced by 100% that year to 75. Uh, so that's been a total, the, the base rate in 93-94 was 51.84, and this year it's 38.46. So it's went down about 38 or 39% over those 22 years. It goes down a little bit easier because the bond rate was Which means there's been a lot of growth. There's been a lot of growth, the bond rate's been down. So is there, is there any, any questions? I just remember when we went out for the first building bond, we were trying to say there'd be over $3 billion worth of property tax, and everyone thought we were crazy. And now you're talking about 5 point, what, 5.5. 5.5. It's a big difference. We're nervous when we look at uh, the amount of growth that we've had from one year to the next, and we're talking about the possibility of, uh, of asking you all to once again approve the 74%. I've asked Terry to look at some numbers. If we went to 75%, my recommendation would have been different had we lost growth money in um, pilot money, but that doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, so instead of asking for that slight increase, I'd like to ask the board that we accept. Uh, Taylor's presentation to keep the, the levy, excess levy rate at 74% for the 2015-16 fiscal year. So moved. I need a second. second. All right. Any further discussion? I think we need to save the county's money for roads. <laughs> 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 All, All right. right. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? Uh, the board does need to approve the schedule. So I can submit it in the morning to the newspaper and the state. Okay, so we'll approve the schedule. All in favor of approving the schedule for Secretary to uh, give the state auditor's office say aye. <coughs> Those opposed? All right, looks good. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> okay. 215, 216 calendar. Um, oh. You have before you what's proposed as far as the the calendar committee met and they looked at the possibilities of in relationship to how to structure the calendar for next year. You have that before you, uh, before it goes out to vote. We wanted to present that to you all to see if you had any questions or concerns. Uh, some highlights of the calendar are very similar to what we had last year. We have a full week of Thanksgiving off under the understanding that there are three days in Thanksgiving that could be made up that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We also have two full weeks at uh, the holiday, winter holiday season. We also have that Monday and Tuesday and possibly Wednesday of that week if we wanted to make those up, which would be December 21, 22, and 23. So we've got at least five days built in the first semester for possible makeups, and that's true on both on both calendars, even though we have kids going on the second calendar, as you see, uh, that's still available for makeup if we need that. We also, if you look into it, have a um, wraparound spring break as we had this year. And that's a Thursday and Friday, as well as the Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday and Tuesday of that following week, which worked out real well. Once again, all four, or this year, we've taken two of those days for possible makeup. We have four OSE days, as they're referred to, which is out-of-school environment days, 
in the second semester. So technically, we have approximately 10, to 12, 10 days that we can make up with some of them in the beginning of the far first semester and several of those at the end of the semester, uh, second semester. As you can see, both of those calendars end, I believe, on uh, June uh, May 30th is the Memorial Day, and May 31st is the last day for students. And as you can see, we also have some OSE days on June 1st or 2nd, and the last day for teachers could be June 3rd, provided that we have a, a relatively light winter once again. So those are uh, what our employees will be voting on. Uh, I'm not asking for a, a motion for either one of you to approve, but if there's some, something you want to add, Lewis is here. Lewis is right. there. You go. Lewis, do you have any comments? The only comment I have on a calendar is this this coming year, if the board is okay with this calendar, we are going to vote electronically instead of paper pencil. I won't have to count ballots. <laughs> About time. I have a question. Also. Basically, the calendar is the same, and the committee, uh, the committee worked hard on it and finished it, and, and wanted to get out of school prior to summer vacation. And you could see there's very little difference in the calendar, the uh, winter break, and uh, that's basically where it is. Students so started August 19th on both calendars. Teachers technically start the 14th, but that's a possible professional development day uh, that we're trying to develop some activities online. If not, they can report to their buildings on that first day. On the 17th and 18th, as you can see, will be preparation and CD or CE um, development days. Those three days at the beginning of the year are in direct response to several of our organizations that said the two days weren't enough. And so we certainly do appreciate that. So we wanted to see if we could put three days back at the beginning of the year. We have a parent-teacher conference in there, which is what the board wants. That's in there as well. So we try to address everybody's uh, needs in relationship to that. Mike? Veterans Day. Yes, sir. I know this is November 10th. Yes, sir. Is that, I mean, Veterans Day is the 11th, but... Uh, the 11th, I think, is... Uh, Wednesday. I'd have to... Well, I mean, Veterans Day is the 11th, but I didn't know if that was a typo or... or well, let me check my calendar. 11th, 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 <laughs> we got a bad one? <laughs> well, we went over with a fine tooth comb today. Okay. But you already have it in your computer. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, so, what about graduation then? Would graduation be on the final day this year? Uh, I believe it is. We're looking at that. Is this year it's not? Or this next year? Year. Next year. Next year we'll be able to do it because we'll meet all that criteria. Right. Yeah. And, I'm in, and the criteria that Nancy's referring to so that the audience knows is you can't end your seniors any longer than five days prior to the end of the school year in relationship to graduation. And once graduation is set, and that's been some of the confusion this year, it's set. We don't have a lot of flexibility, but you can see we have it closer to the end of the year this coming in these calendars. Well, it's, it's, the calendar just worked out that way. Absolutely. That's good for just lucky. All right. Any other questions, comments? There are comments I get a lot. I hear a lot to wrap around. You know, they like to take the two week, two weekends into their spring break. If you just added one more day and put it in the same week, really, I mean, then you have two weekends. But realistically, what's the chance we're actually not going to have any snow days if we have to get off five of them off? Who knows? That's exactly right. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we try to get a wrap around idea. I don't think we've had a spring break probably the last three years because of the weather. We would have lost this year's break as well. It did happen, though, in 1986. <laughs> yes. Those people scheduled to be in Disney World for a week, and then they got to cancel that because it snows. It yeah. becomes a mess. Yeah, it does. Our athletic teams, uh, baseball and softball, like to travel on those times, and that's, that's problematic for them as well. So, so every, not everybody, but they seem to vote the wraparound last year, so that's why I authorized them to look at it again this year. So. Well, the, the hue and cry from the community was, we don't want to go into June. So that's the compromise. 
The other part of that, if you remember from our hearings, was uh, the AP teachers wanted to have as many days prior to the end of the school year, so we have that as well. We have minimal days in June to make up because we might have one in most of our days prior to that, so uh, our AP teachers can get the instruction they need for students to pass those tests. I did a uh, really in-depth survey with my 10-year-old grandson, and I asked him if he would prefer the snow days or going later in the summer. And once I explained to him what he was training, he said, I would rather have went to school during the snow days and have a longer summer. Mm -hmm. I tried that a couple times, but it wasn't so possible. <laughs> it didn't go over so well. <laughs> You're not asking the grandkids. Right. I have to call him one more day. Okay, any other suggestions? All right, Lois, with that one change, uh, we're going to give that electronically again. Okay. Okay. Uh, board members, on snow makeup days, we have two more days we need for you to make up, please. Uh, and those were due to the snow that we had in March. So it's June 10 and June 11. I'd like for you to uh, alter uh, our calendar presently this year to make both of those instructional days so that we can uh, convert and have our full 180 days in place. June 12th will be the last day now for the instructional staff. Last day for students is now. Last day for students now is June 11th. Now, having said that, there's been an awful lot of talk about a waiver. Right. And a lot of that talk has turned out to be rhetoric. It appears mm -hmm. that uh, many people are taking a stance that 180 means 180. And so we're sort of going to adopt that philosophy in relationship to that. Some thought that since we had a day or that two emergency days due to the heavy snow, that that in turn would convert back to uh, we'd be given instead of 108 days, 178 days. That was not the case. There is a waiver that's out there. And from what I understand and from some of the, some of the uh, uh, conversations that have been going on, is that if a county can't get their 180 days in by the end of June, they have a, an opportunity to apply for a waiver to the state and to waive either schools on Saturday and Sunday or go to school on, I think, the holiday, which is Memorial Day and West Virginia Day. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are, if you go beyond June 30th, that you can kind of try and ask for that waiver or to exceed um, past June 30th. That is not affecting Montague County. We get our 180 days in by June 10th. It's my understanding there may, may be one or two counties that that may affect and so they may have to be applying for that waiver under that understanding. But the governor did not close anything down on those states of emergency. That state of emergency was specifically for FEMA to get them involved with the federal government, get the National Guard motivated, do some other kinds of things that he would not be able to do unless it was a state of emergency, but it was not an issue of cancellation. The state superintendent has also the possibility, as well as the state board, to once again grant those days back or reinsert those days for cancellation as non-school days and hold on to that. The state board has not, uh, to my understanding, nor the state superintendent has requested the counties to submit that in with their waiver, and so we're going to have 180 instructional days based on the recommendation that I've given. And we still can't change minutes for days? We still cannot change minutes for days. That was another issue of accrued time. As of right now, accrued time can only be applied for, as you know, an early dismissal or a late start in some capacity. There is a bill that's out there, and I've read the bill, and it's as difficult to understand as anything. If the governor chooses to sign it, I believe it's House Bill 2377, and it does mention some things on accrued time, and it does give some flexibility, but that's not until next year and the governor hasn't signed that either. But that's going to be subject to interpretation as well. And it does mention accrued time. But what can an accrued time be used for is what we're going to have to wait for the interpretation to be. So with that, board members of Madam President, I'd like to alter this year's calendar, the 2014-2015, to reflect June 10th and June 11th as please. with June 12th be the last teacher's day. Okay, I need a motion. So moved. Second. All right, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor of modifying the calendar to the uh, proposal the superintendent's made, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, uh, consent agenda, just one change on their student trips, item number two. We had it listed, I think, in your original information that you received. Beth has since corrected it. But number two, we had two days, and those students are missing the co curricular, I believe, for five days. So I just wanted to draw that to your attention to make sure you understood that. So it's four days, I'm sorry. Thank you, Beth. So with that, uh, board members, I'd like to ask the board to accept the consent agenda as presented. Okay, and I have a motion. Any discussion? Yeah, I'm wondering, is, so robotics is co-curricular? Yes, sir. 
is that, is that something we teach in the schools? Or how, where do we make that determination? Uh, it's, it's probably more related to the mathematics part of that in the science and engineering classes that we have. So I was wondering how we tied that into curricular. And all those kids are in those classes at that time, or just? Yeah, it's, it's, this is after hours, this is extracurricular, but it's also sponsored. We have extracurricular coaches that are at those meetings that are employed by, by our system. And so we're able to kind of work that as a curricular issue, or a curricular class. I don't know that it extends from that program over to the actual class itself, other than the knowledge that students gain by working on these robotics as well as using it as well. Thank you. And is there, is there a, a, an extent of how many days they can go for that for the year? Because they got four here. And I mean, they're not doing four because it could be a year round thing. They're not doing four and follow four in the spring. I didn't look back through the minutes. No, you're right. This board has not asked me to look at co curricular numbers or any extracurricular. And so we don't have a cap on co curricular activities. More students, if they participated in two or three different things, if you'll notice, some of those kids attend a couple different things. Uh, we've done cap co curricular, we've done cap extracurricular. And two. Well, and then they have, they can trace back academic components, even for communications, English. Uh, it's not just STEM. Economics. The whole thing. It's a whole, I mean, they can trace all the, they have to uh, have, a, they have a writing component, they have a presentation, communications. Marketing. It's not, Science. and that's, yeah. I think that's always been the thing. It isn't just a trip just for the competition, it's everything else that goes with it. Yeah, they have to present, it, but we're, I'm sorry, yeah. No, they have to present their project in depth. They also have to, you know, do the kinds of things to, to make the project work. You know, there's, there's several kids that are doing different things, programming, so there's a lot of things that are attached to that. All those students that attend those do in fact work, but it is outside the classroom, and it is something that uh, they do have to take work with them when they go, it's outside the classroom, that they not just be, Science or, or math, obviously. It's really like really. the embedded situation we've dealt with now at yeah. the at tech. But we're we're concentrating on we're considering academics only things that are technology education. Uh, you could have a gym future gym teacher argue that playing on a football team or in a wrestling team was just as important for their future as somebody learning how to do robotics. And that was the case, but the only difference in the law is clear about what's extracurricular and what's co-curricular. And those sports you mentioned are extracurricular, so I have behind that as being able to make my decisions on what is and what isn't. I'm just wondering as I step back and think, because I mean, usually sports is what we've everyone thinking about sports here. It's actually the other way around, and it's the sports side that's taking the. No, you're exactly right. That, that was the argument that was made. Absolutely, we're going to buy it. You're exactly right with the wrestling team that went out to uh, New York and the. And the learning that would take place in relationship to that, that is an argument that was made. You're exactly right. Yeah, but that, what they were learning, they were learning how to, their physical activity. But well, as a board, I, I don't know that I'm comfortable defining something as curricular that is no more curricular than, than, a, than a sporting event. I mean, I, I don't know that. I mean, they've made that determination because it's all SSAC. And, and since they are sports and they are extracurricular, but I, I still think that this is an extracurricular. It's beyond curricular. It is it's something that would be uh, potentially, potentially an argument for someone in the, in the sports field could say, you're just looking at it in one, in one way. I think, well, that's I what think Kyle said when he came, actually. If you, if you, I mean, that was his whole presentation, was that what determined the difference between Model UN and the potential, uh, the physical activity as well as the potential learning activities that went with their trip to New York. I mean, that was what his whole basis of his presentation was on. Was right. that it wasn't just? Yeah, I just I I'm just stepping back and saying, is there a, is there something that, as we argue why this is a co a co curricular, somebody else argued the opposite, and we said no. So, we have to decide what's an extension of the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. I think everything is everything that kids do is an extension of the classroom. If it's anything from social skills to to uh, academic skills, I mean it's all an extension of the classroom. So I'm just wanting. 
uh, hang on the fact too that at least last year they had a hundred percent graduation rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is an extension of the classroom in that aspect. Okay, I'm that. just I'm not I'm just yeah, that, I'm just saying I think that there's I just think because something is mathematics don't mean it's more curricular than something that's physical. Well, we like to think that anything we do in our high school does have value. Okay, you know whatever right. case might be. But once again, we hang our hat on the fact that the state has been very clear in relationship to the new calendar revisions, what they are counting as extracurricular and co-curricular, and within that policy, they discuss the co-curricular as being excused absences that children are allowed to be able to attend. And so for us, it becomes what is an extension of that classroom. And you're exactly right, remember, that all things should be an extension of the classroom, whether it's athletic or whatever the case might be, but that's where we hang our hat in relationship to that definition of extracurricular and co-curricular. And we address it from there. Bringing up as a concern, we might have. Well, we can certainly look at it if you want. I mean, I, I hate to ask teachers to do more paperwork, but we can certainly ask them to justify what is a curriculum versus a extra curriculum if it's outside that definition. I just don't think it was. Is there necessarily a definition? Are we clear on what is co and what is not? I, I'm clear as mud with me. <laughs> just a little bit nervous. Huh? Yeah. Um. The early, the Head Start continuous grant, is there anything different in there or anything that was changed or? Not necessarily. Uh, there has some changes we have to bring before you uh, the next month where there have been some changes last minute that we need to comply with, but it's pretty much the same grant as it has been before. We've been reauthorized with it once again. Uh, Brenda just got the information, I think, just within the past couple of days. So it's just a continuation of what's going on. So uh, we're pleased. I think, we're, again, we're one of three or four counties in the state that have that within the county level. Okay. And then, three. Three. Wow. It's a lot of work, too, but it's mm -hmm. worth it. Okay, any other discussion? If not, all of, uh, in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Those opposed, likewise. Motion carried. <coughs> Uh, board members, under excess property, you had asked us to research any excess property that we may or may not have. We notified a contact with the assessor's office. They were able to provide to us uh, what they considered to be property owned and operated by the Board of Education. We have that before you, and everything that we have on there is, in fact, property that is owned by the board that we either have a school sitting on it or we have a building of some sort that's there or some small property that's there. So. It is accounted for everything that we have, and we're not aware of anything out there that maybe um, might not be property of the board, which is sitting idly that we don't know anything about. So. Okay, so now we know where we are. Now we know where we are. Well, it's taken a long time to get this information in this kind of a format. I mean, uh -huh. this is really a very nice it report. Is. The assessor was able to provide that for us when we asked, and then Mr. Hawkins was able to go back and research. And he researched the deeds and did whatever he needed to do to make sure that we knew this property matched up with everything that we had. So there's some due diligence on the finance part. Yep. Just all the property we have? No, that's not all the property we have. But these properties <coughs> are currently being used. Um, a couple of them were this building, the maintenance shop. I think one of them. Uh, the only one that <coughs> The little one at Osage, which is our interest in the storage treatment, by the way, uh, it's like a 32nd or a 16th or something. I saw that old as my history of the rest of them are currently uh, being used. Okay, future board meeting. Uh, you heard uh, Mr. Hawkins talk about another board meeting in April. I'd like you to check your calendar so we can go over some things. But obviously we have April, we have April 14th, and April 28th as our regular meetings. I'd like you to schedule April 21st as a statutory meeting because tonight we will not adjourn. Tonight we will recess and then reconvene this meeting on April 21st. Now what I'd like for you to do is plan on reconvening at that time and then once again adjourn and then I'm going to have a regular meeting right after that or a special meeting. So don't plan on coming in saying I and leave. So, so we'll hold on to you. What will the special meeting be about? Because I'm actually going to be out of town. I mean, I, mean I know we're going to open up and 
approve the levy rate. So then the special meeting after that will be nothing. We'll just and we'll cover business whatever needs to be done at that time. If there's a full agenda, or if there's some items that we need to address that we can't wait to follow them. I just don't want a board meeting to go by without uh, doing some sort of school business if we need to. It. Absolutely. Once he has us here, yes, we'll let you get them. Absolutely. You're not allowed to guess. So that'll be at, at 7 o'clock again? Or? Yes, ma'am. So we have 21st. 14, 21, and 28, 21st being in the uh, statutory meeting. Okay. So I'll let you know if I'm going to call in today. Okay. 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 And then we also have the 12th and the 26th. And I'd like you to put down the 19th. <laughs> That'll be our retirement dinner. <laughs> May 19th will be the retirement dinner. That will be obviously a meeting, but certainly want you to schedule your time if you can. And those are Tuesdays as well. 12, 19, and 26. 19th retirement dinner. Yes. And then on the 28th of April, we hope to have the board docs training at that time. So please make a point to be here, as you know. That will be the new process on what uh, we do with our board meetings. And so graduation is the... I don't have this 29th and 30th. 29th and 30th. MTEX is the 27th. ABE will be the 28th. 29th is Clayton and University High. And the 30th is Morgantown High. And we'll get all those things to you, right? I can put them down to you. I will not be here on the 14th. Are you May 19th? 14th. Um, April. April. Yes. I will be here. What time is the retirement time? Retirement dinner starts at 6, yes, sir. 6 or 5.30 about? 6? Uh, 5.30 for the picture of the retirees. And 6 for retirees. Mm -hmm. Yes, And well, right now we're still playing around in tech. That facility. Okay. How many are we having? All right, uh, we signed a lot of certificates. Is this many? 58, currently. 58, yeah. All, those, those, all don't usually come. And so we have a representative from a couple associations tonight here. You all have been very generous before to help support that retirement that dinner with the contribution. So I would certainly hope you all would consider that as well. That makes it that makes it possible for the retiree to get a dinner free as well as whatever uh, significant others they bring with them to, to be able to get that as well. Yeah. Now I'm going to put pressure on this right in front of the audience to be able to do that. But they've been very generous up to this point. Yeah, check check yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we didn't have as did we have well we asked, did we have as many retirees this year as we did last year? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. You'll get. We're still getting more coming out. Uh, that's what we use Total. Total. Because that has a huge impact. Always. <laughs> we could go into um, executive session for personnel, if you can, please. We have something else to discuss with you. All right. I have a motion. All right. All right. We'll take a five-minute break to go into executive session.